Richard Joseph Nunn. Um, now, the Nunn name may be familiar to people both in, in uh, this area and also in uh, Wexford Town. Uh, those Wex Wexford Town people may remember a place called Nunn's Stores, it was grain stores, um, which was roughly where, um, uh, just the opposite where Tesco is now in Wexford Town. <clears throat> and uh, I actually remember it as a mill store, believe it or not. It's now a block of apartments, I think. Um, <clears throat> and so I was delighted to be asked to uh, facilitate <laughs> Howard here today. And he's going to talk, as I said, about Richard Joseph Nunn. Um, and the first thing I wanted to say was that we've kind of discovered through my good friend Michael uh, Dempsey in Wexford Library, former colleague, that Richard Joseph Nunn was not born in 1831. <laughs> he was actually born probably in 1833 or 4. So that's the first thing. <laughs> But anyway, all these things came out just simply because Howard has done so much work on him in the States. So now I'm going to hand you straight over to Howard. Uh, thank you, Salisbury. I was sort of thinking about Richard Joseph Nunn as a story that we're uncovering. And as this is a writer's festival, um, recently, I guy kind of came out of the woodwork to me and he's writing historical fiction and uh, he wants to have one of his characters travel from Ireland to Savannah and he quickly realized that he knew absolutely nothing about how to situate him. How did he get to Savannah? Why did he go to Savannah? What did he do in Savannah? So I do think there is a place for um, this kind of historical research in the world of fiction, right? If you, if you want to make your fictional account resonate, um, having it have historical veracity is, is super important. Um, so I was thinking about uh, texts that you might know uh, from Savannah. Of course, the one that immediately came to mind is a work of what I guess we would call non-fiction novel. Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. So I imagine some of you have read that text. So I, to begin with, let's, let's just kind of read a little passage from Midnight in the Garden of, of Good and Evil. So I'm, I'm quoting here. We turned off Victory Drive. So Victory Drive is a big boulevard in Savannah onto a winding road that took us to the gates of Bonaventure Cemetery a live oak forest of primeval dimensions loomed before us. So we're getting kind of drawn into this pretty extraordinary cemetery in Savannah. Um, there's a description there of the moss-covered statues standing in an overgrowth of shrubbery like the remains of an abandoned temple. So Savannah is a very atmospheric city and probably nowhere is quite as atmospheric as Bonaventure Cemetery. So if you remember the text, if you've read it, the reason to go to the cemetery is in part to uncover the grave of someone else you may have heard of, one of Savannah's most famous sons, Johnny Mercer. So Johnny Mercer, uh, he wrote uh, Moon River, which is actually a river in Savannah. Uh, Fools rush in. That old black magic, I'm feeling Sinatra vibes here. <laughs> um, and so in the text, they uh, push away leaves and other debris that are over the slab, uh, which commemorates and where Johnny Mercer is buried. And uh, Johnny Mercer was born in uh, 1909. There's another grave, though, in uh, Bonaventure Cemetery. Um, and it went up the year after. 
Johnny Mercer was born in 1910. So we may have some questions about when Richard Joseph Nunn was born, but we know for sure he died in 1910. So it's fascinating to me that there is a Wexford grave in Bonaventure Cemetery because most of the Wexford tombstones in Savannah are in Catholic cemetery. Uh, the vast majority of Wexford people who went to Savannah were Catholics. Uh, but Richard Joseph Nunn was not. Um, he actually attended St. John's Episcopal Church in downtown Savannah. Um, the, the grave is, is quite arresting. It's a, a, a large square marble column. And on the front of it, it's a very sort of minimal set of words. But I want to share those with you. The, the gravestone says, Richard Joseph Nunn, scholar, physician, Freemason, born Wexford, Ireland, died Savannah, Georgia. It's extraordinary to me that these folks from Wexford always felt Wexfordian in Savannah. They always wanted to acknowledge their Wexford roots. So there's a very small number of words, a kind of word cloud, and there in the middle of that cloud is born Wexford, Ireland. So I hope that when I'm done, you'll want to know more about this guy, and he should be commemorated in Wexford. And he should also be commemorated more in Savannah. Um, in doing this little bit of research, I came across another individual who may be his uncle. We don't know. This is the fun thing about doing historical research. Um, his father's name was Richard Maddock Nunn. So Maddock is an unusual name. Um, but then there's a an individual who would be contemporary with Richard Maddock um, Nunn, whose name is Joseph Maddock Nunn. Of course, our guy is Richard Joseph Nunn. But anyway, this Joseph Maddock Nunn, he died in 1829. He was only 28 years of age. He died, he was on a Mexican naval frigate off the coast of Mexico at Veracruz. He was swimming in the ocean and he was attacked by a shark and died. So I'm wondering, is that Richard Joseph's nun's uncle? So that's to be determined. So maybe you can crowdsource that. Maybe you know the answer, but anyway. All right, so a little bit about Richard Joseph's nun, uh, his upbringing in Wexford. So his father, as I say, Richard Maddock Nunn, he was a physician in Wexford. Um, he had graduated from Apothecary's Hall in Dublin. And back in the day, in the 1820s, that was really where one got a medical degree to practice in Ireland. Um, and then he went on to become a member of the Royal College of Surgeons of England. So he is a well-qualified doctor and he's working in Wexford. He was um, the surgeon at Wexford Cholera Hospital. And then he was the medical attendant at the Wexford House of Industry and Lunatic Asylum. That was new to me. Wexford House of Industry and Lunatic Asylum. But these houses of industry were actually fairly common in Ireland in the early 19th century. Then he was a medical officer at the Wexford Lying In Hospital and the apothecary at Wexford County Infirmary. So we kind of covered the waterfront as regards medical services in the town of Wexford. Um, so that was his vocation, his training. That was the atmosphere in which his son, Richard Joseph Nunn, grew up. Um, but the father had an avocation as well, a passion, and that was his membership of the Masonic Lodge in Wexford. He was the secretary of the lodge. Um, the father published, uh, he published actually in the Lancet, probably the most prestigious medical journal in this part of the world. Um, and he was an inventor of medical devices, and he actually exhibited a device uh, in the Crystal Palace in London during the Great Exhibition. Um, and the latter part of his life, he became kind of peripathetic. He, he moved from Wexford, 
he relocated to the town of um, Grays in Essex and he practiced medicine there. And then when his son moved to Savannah and got established in Savannah, he moved to Savannah for a while. Um, but ultimately he went back to England. Um, so there's still a lot to know about the, the father. But just to kind of summarize, his father, Richard Maddox Nunn, was a very established figure in the medical community in the town of Wexford. Um, so we wanted to uh, learn more about Richard Joseph Nunn as a member of the Wexford diaspora in Savannah, Georgia. For those of you who don't know, during prime time for Irish migration to Savannah, which would have been the 1840s and 50s, the Irish population in Savannah doubled. So it was very significant Irish population in Savannah, about 60% of the foreign born residents of Savannah came from Ireland. Um, of that diaspora, 56%, well over half, emigrated from Wexford. So when you're in Savannah, Georgia, and you're looking at Irish names, it's Wexford names. It's Doyle, and Rossiter, and Corish, and Sinnott, and Stafford. Um, so we, we have this most extraordinary Wexford story in Savannah, and we're trying to deepen our understanding of it by looking at individualized stories such as that of Richard Joseph Nunn. So the question is, how did this young guy, as he was then, he was 19 when he thought about going to Savannah, uh, how did that happen? Um, so he became aware of a passage from Wexford. You could sail directly from Wexford to town with a company called the Allens, or from New Ross with a company called the Graves, uh, to Savannah. In fact, the very first voyage that the original Dun Brody out of New Ross, that was a grave ship, the very first voyage it took as a commercial vessel was to Savannah, Georgia. So a sister ship off the Dun Brody was called the Glen Lion. And Graves took out advertisements in the Wexford Independent newspaper to offer winter passage to Savannah. So clearly, Richard Joseph Nunn, 19-year-old, son of a doctor, Wexford Town, has an adventurous spirit. He decides he wants to go to Savannah. So he wrote a letter to William Graves, the patriarch of the Graves Company, and he volunteered his services as a ship doctor on the Glen Lion. Now, he wasn't qualified as a doctor. <laughs> uh, he had dabbled in medicine. <coughs> And he was quite audacious. He said, I need to be paid for this. So he wasn't looking for free passage, so he was negotiating his passage. And I guess William Graves was happy to have anybody as, who had some sort of medical, at least he would be adjacent to a medical qualification. So that's how we ended up going to Savannah. How we know that is one of my students was working with on catalog material in the National Archives of Ireland and Dublin, and she came upon the letter. That is magic when that kind of thing happens and you really start to feel some ownership and excitement about the story. Um, so he saw, sailed on the Glen Lyon, a, a, a voyage that departed New Ross on October the 7th of 1851. So that would have been right in prime time for this Wexford migration to Savannah. Um, we're lucky because um, a very interesting instance of what we would call transnational journalism occurred. The Wexford Independent republished a small article that had appeared in the Savannah Daily News about that voyage. And you know, we're, I think, in Ireland brought up to think about famine era or immediate post-famine era migration with two kind of quick and dirty phrases. One is, no Irish need apply, right? When you get to America, you're not welcome. And the other is coffin ships. And this story of the Wexford migration to Savannah, it knocks both of those flat. Uh, the Wexford people were extraordinarily welcomed. Most of them were Catholics, and Savannah is a majority Protestant city, but there was something about their work ethic, 
their demeanor um, that excited people in Savannah. Um, and Graves predicated its service on safety. It had almost no mortality in all of those uh, voyages. So here is the um, quotation from the Savannah Daily News that, as I say, was then reprinted for Wexford audiences um, in the, uh, the Wexford Independent. Captain Jameson, he was the captain of the Glen Lion, 220 steerage-class emigrants from Wexford, Ireland. We have never seen a finer body of people from the old country. They are all healthy-looking and well-clad, having the air and manners of worthy and industrious people. I think for those of you from Wexford, that should make your heart beat a little bit faster, right? To think that those are your ancestors, those are your people, and that is the reputation that they delivered in Savannah, Georgia. The air and manners of worthy and industrious people. And one of those people was Richard Joseph Nunn. A bit of a chancer, right? Uh, but he went on to do good things in Savannah. Just as a matter of interest, what else was on that vessel uh, included some, some produce from southeastern Ireland. Uh, this is just in the immediate aftermath of the potato famine, but they were exporting, quote, finest quality Irish potatoes in hampers. Um, also from a marble company in Waterford City, Hanson marble mantelpieces. I'd love to know where they ended up in Savannah, that would be great. And then, of course, prime Irish double stack porter. And that was from Strangman's in Waterford, David Strangman and Company in Waterford. All right, so um, very soon after he arrived in Savannah, um, it seems like Richard Joseph Nunn read the scene um, because he went down to the city hall and he filled out what was called a bona fide declaration. So if you're ever writing a novel about Irish immigrants in the United States in the 19th century, this is good to know. Um, in America at that time, you had to fill out a bona fide or a you know, serious intention document to say that you would be prepared in due course to renounce your citizenship of the United Kingdom, of which Ireland was a part at that time. Um, and uh, that was then on file, and about three years later, you could go and apply for a passport. So that's how it worked. So clearly, Richard Joseph Nunn, he was barely off the ship before he went down to City Hall to fill out his bona fide. So I, I think it was in his mind that he was going to stay in Savannah, and that's what he did. Um, his second full year in Savannah was 1853, um, and that coincided with the establishment of the Savannah Medical College, no longer exists. But um, I just wanted to dwell a little bit on the idea of these local, as they were called, medical colleges. Uh, they were a phenomenon in the mid-19th century in the United States, where smaller communities like Savannah um, established their own indigenous medical colleges. Um, so none enrolled there, uh, he was in the initial class, um, and then he graduated with his MD sometime later. Now, what is horrifying to me is that he could start in November of 1853 and be fully qualified as a doctor in March of 1854. <laughs> what? It's <laughs> just like weeks. Of, and that, he has a Christmas break as well, so... <laughs> Uh, but really scary, to be honest with you, but that's the deal. He, he graduated, uh, one of five men who graduated. Um, so later on, then became very prominent in the Georgian Medical Association. He did tremendous work for that statewide entity, which really managed the medical profession in the very large state of Georgia. And Georgia's twice the size of Ireland. Um, but he 
advocated successfully um, that a student, and I'm going to quote his words, should undergo three years course of training <laughs> before graduating. So I guess he realized he was under-trained himself. Um, but just to kind of dwell a little bit on that phenomenon of the local medical school, um, here's a, a little uh, few words that were delivered um, at the opening of that first session of the Savannah Medical College. A medical school, the speaker said, more than any other type of school requires to be local. I should rather, for one of the fevers of our climate, be in the hands of a physician who was experienced in the diseases of the country than under the skill of the most renowned practitioner to whom the particular type of fever was unknown. To sort of deconstruct that, what he's saying is that in a city like Savannah, Georgia, or any city, there are going to be diseases that are specific to the place because of the climate. And it's better to have someone train in your city and know your diseases than even a very renowned physician or surgeon from elsewhere kind of helicopter in and try to fix things. So of course the question then is, what would have been the disease of the country in Savannah, Georgia in the middle of the 1800s? And I'm sure you all can guess the correct answer, yellow fever. Yellow fever, um, also known as the black vomit, and also known as the stranger's disease because people who were not from there were more susceptible to getting it. They had less immunity. So the year, 1854, in which none graduated from Savannah Medical College, that was one of the worst years for yellow fever in the entire history of Savannah. Although none was actually not in Savannah then. We don't know where he was. And maybe he had returned to Ireland, uh, to visit his father, we don't know, um, to be determined. Um, but we do know that um, of all the deaths in the yellow fever epidemic of 1854 in Savannah, Georgia, 45% of the victims, 45% were from Ireland. And remember, almost half the Irish in Savannah are from Wexford at that time. So there was a huge Wexford death toll. So it's a good story, you know, the Wexford diaspora in Savannah, but there's tragedy as well. So they're welcome. They're welcome by the city, but not by yellow fever. So as I say, Nunn was not in Savannah that year of 1854, but he was back in practicing medicine in Savannah the next year, 1855. And there was a huge yellow fever epidemic in Norfolk, Virginia that year. One of the worst in the entire history of the disease anywhere. And the city of Savannah, because it had just lived through yellow fever, the mayor, the alderman, they raised funds and they dispatched a group of Savannah doctors to Norfolk out of what would have been understood at the time as a good Samaritan ethos. In fact, that was the term that was used. They were seen as Samaritans going to help their brethren in Norfolk, Virginia. And one of those men was Richard Joseph Nunn, barely qualified as a doctor. And he accompanied a much more senior doctor and others from Savannah. Um, and he actually contracted yellow fever in Norfolk, which is unsurprising. In fact, there was a rumor going around Savannah that he had died in Norfolk, but he did recover. His health was never good after that. He was compromised, as you can only imagine, right? Um, interestingly, when they all came back to Savannah, there was a big hullabaloo uh, because um, the city had told them they were going to compensate them for, you know, they would have lost business because they're not in their own offices, so there's a lack of income. Um, so it, it took a while to iron out 
where are they going to get paid, how much were they going to get paid, um, but in the end, uh, they did. And we actually know what Richard Joseph Nunn got paid. Um, uh, it was about $250, which would have been a good whack of money uh, at that time. Um, so, Richard Joseph Nunn, he, he did have a sort of baptism by fire, baptism by yellow fever, the disease of the country. He went on to have a, a, a successful, pretty lucrative um, medical business um, in Savannah. He gained great respect uh, among uh, his patients, among his fellow doctors, and as I say, he rose through the ranks at the state level. Um, and, and ultimately, actually, he served a, a term as president of the Georgia Medical Society, which would be the governing body for doctors. So that in itself is a pretty big achievement. In 1876, um, Nunn's health had sort of taken a turn for the worst. Um, and he was advised by his own physician uh, to leave Savannah um, especially to avoid the summer months, which are brutally hot and humid, and to travel to Europe um, and uh, just have a more salubrious and more healthy uh, experience there. But he was barely out of the city of Savannah to make his European trip in 1876 when the city got hit one more time with yellow fever. The first victim of that particular epidemic was a kid, the son of two immigrants from Wexford, Ireland. And uh, none knew that. He was, he was given that information, and that turned him around. He almost felt one of his own calling him, and he went back to Savannah. And remember, he is in compromised health himself. And he served in the trenches in that yellow fever epidemic and in very short order, um, the death toll reached 1,066 people. It was actually a sort of a quick in and out epidemic. So we have all lived through COVID. Um, if you can just imagine what that was like. Um, so extraordinary, extraordinary. Um, and his self-sacrifice, his fortitude, um, it, was, it was noted. Um, in fact, a motion was put forward by the um, Georgia Medical Society, um, and I, I think it's worth just reading the text to give us all a sense of this man, Richard Joseph Nunn. This was in reference to the work he did in 1876, battling yellow fever. And yellow fever, of course, didn't affect the rich areas as badly as the poor areas. So he was down in the, the slums, uh, with the Irish and black um, uh, residents down there, uh, really, really at ground zero. The citation in praise of Nunn noted that despite being already, quote, worn out and debilitated by incessant labor extending over many years, he would not stay away from Savannah once he learned that the deadly pestilence of yellow fever was raging there. None at once sacrificed his own pleasure and worked with untiring energy in the midst of the epidemic. That is an amazing testimony to a man who was sick himself and was prepared to sacrifice his life to help others. And again, we could just stop the story here, and I think we would all walk out of here saying, that was a remarkable Wexford man. But it becomes more intense in a way that I think is very relevant to the times we live in today, particularly in the United States, where we have become more and more conscious of racial inequity. Um, so, it's interesting to note that the, the black population of Savannah was not badly affected by the yellow fever epidemic of 1854. There was a certain immunity in that population, but in 1876, as Nunn himself noted and presented the paper on, the, the black population was actually significantly impacted. Um, 
But when we think about that, we might wonder, why was he even conscious, or why did he care about African Americans? So, so you were asking me earlier about, did he get involved in the Civil War? And the answer is yes. You know, he, he wasn't a doctor initially in the war. He actually signed up uh, in a heavy artillery battalion. Uh, so he was fighting. Um, he was uh, first lieutenant initially, and then he got promoted to be a captain. Um, so he was fighting for the Confederacy. Um, after a while, his health kind of got the better of him, but he still remained in the army and he, he offered medical services. So on the, on the surface of things, you would say, Richard Joseph Young would not be a, a candidate for really caring that much about African Americans. But maybe it was what he experienced in 1876 that, that really focused him in on that population. Um, on the last day of April of 1879, so we timed this very carefully. So 1876 had been the epidemic, and we're just a few years later in 1879. The day before May Day, he wrote a huge letter multi-multi-paragraph letter to the mayor and alderman of the city of Savannah. And this is what he said. Probably no city of equal size in the United States has done less or as little for its sick poor as Savannah. So he was really attacking his own city. And here is the kind of rubber meets the road piece. He said that before the Civil War, Savannah, which was a majority white city, for every white death, and he's using statistics here, 0 0.66 African American deaths. So there was less uh, than half, really, of, uh, or just around half the African uh, American mortality. But after the war, and he took out the uh, yellow fever year of 1876 in these statistics, so that's not included. But after the war, for every six white deaths, there were 12 black deaths. So before the war, uh, there were four black deaths for every six white ones. And after the war, a huge acceleration in black mortality. 12 African Americans died for every, I'm uh, sorry, um, yeah, 12 for every six whites. So it was double, double. This is what Lund wrote. This is a white man who had fought in the Confederacy as a captain. He said to the mayor, the old one, and because he published in a newspaper to everybody, this is a most damning record of the utter inefficiency of the present system. To what is this terrible mortality attributable? In my opinion, to the want of proper food, <coughs> proper nursing, proper shelter, in one word, proper hospital accommodation. So we might say that, and excuse me, I know we're in a church, but we might say he gave a damn about black health. In a city that, in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, the majority white city, a defeated city, might have cared less. I think that took some courage, and it certainly is a manifestation of his extraordinary compassion. But he wasn't just complaining, he was coming up with a plan, and that's something I noticed about these Wexford immigrants, to speak broadly about what they did in Savannah, they had a plan. So, and this plan is very interesting now, um, given the state of healthcare in the United States. You've probably heard the horror stories, and they're largely true, I have to say. Um, so he said that the city of Savannah should start to fund healthcare. It should categorize people into paupers, in other words, people who had no money at all, and offer 100% funding for healthcare. And then the poor, people who could pay something, but could certainly not fund their own health care. So for paupers, um, he said, 
you know, in worst case scenario, the city brings them into hospital and cares for them and rehabilitates them. But he had this wonderful idea around what I guess we would call preventive medicine, right? Um, he came up with this term, polyclinic. And he said to the city, you should build a series of polyclinics around Savannah. So poly obviously means many. So a clinic, it would offer surgery, it would offer basic doctor consultation, and it would offer dental care. So this is pushing for what I guess nowadays we would call Obamacare, right, <laughs> in the United States. But this is happening in 1879. And uh, Nunn was smart. He got his colleagues in the Georgian Medical Society to endorse his plan. So it was really a pioneering plan in the United States, visionary. Um, now lots of people attacked him for that. Um, this is the issue in the US with healthcare proposals, they die. Um, and uh, one of the critiques that was leveled against Nunn is that because doctors charged so much money for their services, people couldn't access medicine. So the answer was, you start charging less money and more people can access your services. So that would just give you a tenor of the, uh, of the debate. Um, so uh, I, I, I'm going to read you this little section because I think it's fascinating. Uh, one of the attacks on Nunn said that if, if people like Nunn charged less, then respectable, respectable mechanics, hard-working laborers, small shopkeepers, ill-paid clerks, struggling widows, and industrious colored people could actually see a doctor. So doctors are priced out. I see a lot of doctors and I can tell you the bills are pretty crazy. So, um, so what happened in the end? Was Nunn successful in his push to get polyclinics? Well, the answer is no, but he did push the city to employ two doctors full time. So he is offering a kind of medical delivery in situ, meeting people where they are. So there was some degree of progress. Um, Nutton also moved onto the national stage. What he perceived as problems in Savannah, he understood to be problems elsewhere too. So at that time in the late 19th century, as American cities are really growing and becoming more industrial, they're paving roads, they're cutting down trees, and people are flooding into the city. And there's obviously a need for what Nunn called the science of public sanitation. So he became involved in that at the national level. And he brought um, an organization called the American Public Health Association to Savannah. The organization was not yet 10 years old. And it had met in very large cities like New York and Washington, but none was very ambitious and he brought it to the small city of Savannah. And he could have been a spokesperson for the Visit Savannah organization, our tourism agency. He said that hospitality in Savannah could not be exceeded by any. It was warm, it was cordial, and it was genuine. And people like Lucy, who've been in Savannah, and Maura, who've been in Savannah, I think you'll attest it is. It's, it's a very hospitable city. But here is what Nunn said to the assembled delegates from all over the United States who are in the vanguard of public sanitation reform in urban centers. And I think this is the measure of the man. He said that public sanitation, the science of sanitation, was the hallmark of civilization. And that sanitation was the right of everybody. He said, no caste, and these are his words, no caste, no creed, no color should be denied the right to sanitary living conditions. 
But I tell my African-American friends, and our mayor of Savannah, who's been over here, is African-American about none. Mayor Johnson has just made none his new hero. He's talking about none all the time um, because he is putting forward an agenda that was ahead of its time. And he's not putting it forward just in Savannah, Georgia, but on the national stage. I mean, he was audacious to bring that organization to Savannah and to preach at that, right? So, none, again, always practical. So he did a, a survey of Savannah um, to just kind of really get a measure of what was the crisis in public sanitation. He counted every outhouse in the city of Savannah. He counted every dry well in the city of Savannah. And he published a pamphlet which he distributed not only in Savannah but in other cities. Basically he's telling people, this is how it's done. This is the problem and this is what we need to address. And just if you're interested, there were 4,500 outhouses in Savannah. They covered 18 acres of land. So, extraordinary. But that's a certain strange but wonderful mindset, right, that he, he does that. He was an incredibly hard worker. He's not just sort of spouting out stuff and, you know, crying about how we need to change things. He's really demonstrating what the problem is. And uh, the environmentalists among us will be very pleased to know that uh, he absolutely decried the wholesale cutting down of trees in Savannah. He said that trees are really critical to absorbing waste and keeping your ecosystem healthy. And he, he said the march to improvement, again, I'm, I'm hugging my computer here because I think he can speak for himself. He doesn't need me to speak for him. So I'm giving you his words. Um, but yeah, he, he said that the, the, the disappearance of trees was just a phenomenal tragedy and crisis for the city of Savannah. So a unrelenting advocate. As we close up, I just thought I'd tell you a little bit more about none, what I call the other nuns. I mean, all I'm doing here is giving you a little sense of his importance in medical discourse and public health reform, both in Savannah, Georgia, and in the state of Georgia, and indeed nationally. This man, 19-year-old from Wexford Town, what he wrought in the United States, very impressive and very important, and really a story for our time. So what else did he do? Um, well, like his dad, he invented medical devices. Um, he also patented a luggage strap. So those of us who travel, actually I had a suitcase that broke recently. It was only new and I was pretty annoyed by that. Uh, I was thinking I need one of Nun's uh, luggage straps here. Um, um, so we know that because he actually bequeathed the patent to it in his will. Um, so it, it was worth some money to him. Um, I'm getting some medical treatment which actually does involve, they're trying a little bit of sort of uh, electric stimulation of the muscles. So I really related to this one. I was telling my physical therapist about it. Um, he was a member, he was actually the treasurer of an organization. Now this name really blew me out of the water. The American Physio Electro Therapeutic Association. So I guess that's using, you know, electricity to try to stimulate muscles. Um, he was also elected as a trustee of one of Savannah's most prestigious arts um, organizations, the, the Telfair Academy. Um, and he was also elected to the position of curator, which is, is sort of a top level position in the uh, Georgia Historical Society, which is the oldest historical society in the state of Georgia and one of the oldest in the United States. Um, he served on the library committee. He was the chair of the library committee for the Georgia Historical Society. Interestingly, before Savannah had a public library system, this is a writer's festival, so we are invested in books and invested in libraries. And the nun was one of three members of the Historical Society who negotiated with the city of Savannah 
to make the society's library um, effectively a free public library for three years while an actual public library was created. And Nunn did get that over the line, but he was very frustrated because others involved in the negotiation insisted that African Americans not have access to the library. So in his will, he left a significant number of his books to what was called the Savannah Public Colored Library, which was a grassroots organization among the black community in Savannah to create a public library for themselves. Uh, and later that actually was um, funded by, the, by Andrew Carnegie. So the, the first Carnegie Library in Savannah was a black one. Um, but that was a point of frustration for none. Um, and as I say, his will, that, that actually gave me a, a, a shiver when I read in his mouth that he was, in his will, he was leaving a good chunk of his, his library to the Savannah Public Colored Library. His greatest passion outside of medicine, though, was his involvement in Freemasonry. And of course, his father had been a Freemason in, uh, in um, Wexford. If you go to the back of that tombstone, we started off talking about his tombstone in Bonaventure. Um, there is a kind of litany on the back of his achievements as a Mason. Uh, he was the sovereign grand inspector general in Georgia of the Supreme Council of the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite, Southern Jurisdiction, United States of America. So that was his great point of pride as a, a personal achievement. Um, and uh, in fact, his major obituary was written by a fellow Freemason, um, a very prominent architect in Savannah, um, actually designed many of the Catholic churches in Savannah, but he was Jewish. And that's something I love about Samana. Uh, we are a very integrated city. Um, in fact, one of the first members of the Hibernian Society of Samana was Jewish. And that family are still members over 200 years later. Um, in the obituary, his friend memorialized Samana as, quote, a man of broad scientific and philosophic culture, an individual who both by his skill and his purse was ever ready to help suffering humanity. What I would share with you, my friends, this morning is that uh, we in Savannah need to raise Nunn's story up higher than it is, and with Mayor Johnson, that's happening. He's a force of nature, and we'll make sure that none uh, gets his due recognition in Savannah. But I would invite you in Wexford to also raise up this story. This is an important, an important Wexford story. Um, I'm going to close with just one line from Nunn. In connection with Freemasonry, um, there was an effort to raise monies to make a, a, a kind of um, fit for purpose, really a very spectacular uh, Masonic hall. Um, and uh, that actually did come about, uh, the, the cornerstone was laid in 1913, a little bit, just a few years after Nunn had died, but he had done a lot of the fundraising. And to this day, it is an iconic building in Savannah. Um, but this is what Nunn said in connection with the fundraising and how to conceive of the project. So he was thinking, we don't want to have some, as they say in the States, podunk little building. We want to have a building that has resonance, that will endure. And uh, I, th I think for all of us, as we walk out the door this morning, um, these words, I think they, they might ring in our ears and resonate with us. They certainly resonate with me. Nunn said, life is short, and we are building for the future. We ought to plan broadly. Thank you all so much. <laughs>